Jesus makes a very defining statement in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. He says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Think about that statement for a moment. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. A lot of individuals profess to be disciples of Christ. They profess to be Christians. And, and oftentimes what, have, what happens is it is based upon their own definition of what it means to be a disciple of Christ, to be a Christian, to be a child of God. It's based upon their own determined decision. It's not based upon truly what the Bible teaches. Um, the, the, oftentimes they'll view the biblical text as something kind of like Play-Doh. Better yet, silly putty. I remember as a kid, we got to play with silly putty until you got it into the carpet. You couldn't play with it any longer after that. And you can make it into any different thing you wanted to. I remember the commercials would show that you could put it on a, uh, like a comic strip. You know, kind of pull the image up there a little bit about that. People treat the gospel that way. They treat God's word that way. Something that can be taken and shaped to their whim and their fancy. As long as it makes them happy, then they're good. But listen, when, when Jesus was on this earth, he was teaching people what it meant to be a disciple of Christ. What it meant to be one who truly followed him. And he said that in order for this to be, you had to abide within his word. Peter was one of the many disciples, or one of the 12 apostles that walked with Jesus. And we saw a very interesting statement that Peter made in answer to Jesus' question, who do you say that I am, in Mark chapter, Matthew 16. And in that statement, Peter professed his belief that Jesus was the Christ, the anointed one. He was the Christ, the Son of God. Peter said that not because the Lord allowed him to shape the truth, but because it was the truth, and Peter believed that. Now, I want to ask you a question this morning. Whom do you say Jesus is? We already know Peter's answer, and so you can't give that one, because that's already established. That's the truth. So if someone was to ask you, who do you say Jesus is? Or whom do you say he is? What would be your answer? Well, let me share with you this morning four ways you can answer this question from the scriptures. But in order to answer these questions, there is a reality that must be present, a truth that must be in existence in order for you, in order for me, to be able to answer the question properly. Whom do you say Jesus is? Notice here, if you would, for just a moment, consider the idea that we can possibly say that Jesus is our Savior. Could you answer that? If someone said, who do you say Jesus is? Can you say that Jesus is your Savior? You should be able to. You should be willing to do that. But the only way you can answer that question is by asking, answering this question. Have you been saved by the blood of Christ? Now, this is very important. Notice Jesus, we're saying Jesus is our Savior. But He can only be your Savior if you've been saved by the blood of Christ. Jesus, when He came to this world, John records Him saying that He didn't come to judge, but He came to save. Now, granted, the very words by which we are going to be saved will be the very words that will judge us in the end. But in John chapter 12, He makes that point very clear that he's come into the world to save the world, so that he might be the Savior. Think about what 1 John 4, let's look at verses 12 through 16, has to say about this. 1 John chapter 4, and notice a statement that's used here by the same author of the Gospel, John. Here we're looking at the Apostle John, and notice what he says about Jesus and him being the Savior. John, 1 John chapter 4, and let's start our reading there in verse 12, and let's read down through verse 16 for a moment. John chapter 4, beginning of verse 12, here's what we read. No one has seen God at any time. 
If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. He says God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. So notice, if you would, what John says. And isn't this an interesting connection to Jesus' statement? That if my word abides in you, and you abide in my word, that is, you are my disciples. All right, that's what he said back in John chapter 8. But here's what John now writes. He says, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us. Because he has given us his spirit, we have seen and testified the Father has sent the Son of the Savior of the world. So much so that whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So Jesus came to be the Savior of the world. And we recognize that prior to his ascension up into heaven, this is after his death, burial, and resurrection, but prior to his ascension, he's gathered with his apostles And he tells them in Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, that they're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be, now notice this last word, saved. And he who does not believe shall be condemned. Now notice the connecting dot between shall be saved and him saying he came to save the world and he is the savior of the world. Can you say that Jesus is your Savior? You can only truly say that he is, he is your Savior if you have been saved by him. Now, think about this for just a moment. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Paul makes the point that the wages of sin is death. We understand that. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 19. It is by the sin of Adam and that this death has entered into this world, the spiritual separation. Because all sin, those who sin, they're now spiritually dead, separated from God. But notice what Jesus came to do in this saving of the world. What has he saved us from? Well, over in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, we have been saved from this spiritual death. Paul makes a statement there. We're looking at 1 Timothy. Let's start there in chapter 1, and we're going to read down there in verse 10. He says there, 2 Timothy, stay what the chart says, remember. It's always the rule of thumb. Unless I mess up the chart, then I don't know where we're going to go. Anyway, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. But has now been revealed, who? Look at verse 9, by grace which is given to us in Christ Jesus, for time began. But has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So, is Jesus your Savior? Well, I don't know. Has he saved you from this spiritual death? Has he saved you from your trespasses and sins? Have you obeyed the gospel's call unto salvation? Remember what, as we said, we brought up Mark 16, 16 well ago. But remember what Romans 9, or Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 talks about the need to confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus to believe within our heart. It's not some simple state of going into water. It is the belief that predicates that, that comes before that. It is this foundation of of conviction whereby we repent of our sins, we turn away from our sins, we confess that Christ is the Son of God, and we obey His command to be baptized. It is this process upon which we find salvation and the abolishment, if you would, of our sins. And as a result of that, Paul makes a statement there in his letter to the church in Philippi that we are eagerly waiting for something that, listen, if we are not saved from our sins, we cannot await for this. Notice with me in Philippians chapter 3. And note with me there in verses 20 and 21. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Paul says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies, 
that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to him. Notice that we eagerly wait for the Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So now listen, if you have not yet obeyed the gospel's call unto salvation, if you have not turned away from your sins, if you've not been baptized into Christ, then you've not been saved. And if you've not been saved, you cannot say Jesus is your Savior. But if you'll become a Christian this morning, if you'll be saved this morning from your sins by the grace and mercy of God, then when someone says, who is Jesus to you? You can say, he is my Savior. But let's go on. Can you say that Jesus is your Lord and King? Think about that. Can you say to the world, to those who would ask you this question, is Jesus your Lord and King? Can you say yes? Well, here's another question to consider in order to answer that. Have you submitted to his authority? Have you within your life submitted to the authority of Christ? Have you submitted to him his authority as king, his authority as Lord? Let's look at a couple of passages here in relation to this. This statement is seen twice within the scriptures. Paul uses it first in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And note with me if you would in verse 15. Paul writes, which he will, man which he will manifest in his own time, who is the blessed and only potentate, the king of kings, and Lord of Lords. Now, if you look at the context here, look at verse 14, we know that he's talking about Jesus Christ. And even in Revelation, Revelation chapter 19, observe with me there in verse 16. Revelation 19, verse 16. Here, we're talking about the Son of God. We're talking about Jesus Christ within this imagery here. And within this statement, we read, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings. And Lord of Lords. We recognize that, that when Jesus ascended to the right hand side of his Father, after his death, burial, and resurrection, that he sat there to reign over his kingdom. Peter makes this, this observation. He is our King. He is our Lord. The church, think about this. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24, we submit unto him. The church, the body of Christ, submits unto Jesus as king, submits unto Jesus as the head of the body, submits unto his authority and unto his power. And we also find in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, that he is, let's turn over there, he is the source of this salvation to every individual who will obey him. Hebrews chapter 5 there in verse 9, and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. This obedience is a submission. And it's not a one-time submission. You know, I mentioned earlier, you need to be saved from your sins. But it's not a case where, okay, I've been saved from my sins, now I can do whatever I want. Remember I said we cannot treat the, the word of God like silly putty like something that we can shape because it has already been fashioned by God and that truth is unchangeable. So once we choose to become one of God's children, once we submit ourselves into the authority of Christ as our Lord and King, then we must always live our life that way. We cannot apply for asylum, if you would. We cannot go and change our citizenship. I think back to the, there's been a couple different elections, but it's always interesting. You've always got that one somebody who says, well, I want to move to another country and place my citizenship there. They never do, but that's what the threat is. Well, I'm afraid that sometimes individuals may choose today to submit unto the, the, our king and, and our Lord, and then later want to change their citizenship. When it becomes too difficult to live as a Christian. And we can't do that. If you want to be able to say Jesus is your Lord and King, then you must submit unto Him and be added to this kingdom. Notice in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, there is a direct reference here to the kingdom of Christ. Colossians 1, verse 13, He has delivered us. Talking about verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of 
of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. So here we have it. Can you say to the world that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your King? Now, if you've not submitted unto His reign and His rule and His authority, then the answer is no, you can't say that. But the good news is, all you've got to do is make that repentant determination, turn away from your sins, based upon your belief that Christ is the Son of God, and submit through obedience unto the gospel's call unto salvation. And as Paul says, Romans 6, you'll rise up then to walk in the newness of life. In Romans 6, 3 and 4, this newness of life that we rise to walk within is a life walked within the kingdom of the Son of His love. If you do that, become one of God's children, then yes, you can tell people, He is my Lord and my King. Well, let's continue. Can you say that Jesus is your high priest? Now think about this for a moment. To be able to say that Jesus is your high priest. Well, let's answer this question. Have you entered into that state where he is your high priest? And so what state is that? What do you mean by that? Well, to answer the question, think about what Hebrews 8 has to say. We're going to look in Hebrews chapter 8. Notice with me the first two verses there, and then we're going to jump down to verse 8. And this helps explain, just in case there might be a misunderstanding of what we mean by him being our high priest. Hebrews 8 verses 1 and 2, now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. Now pause for a moment and say this. If you've ever said to yourself, you know, the Old Testament isn't really that necessary to study, then you really shortchange your understanding of this passage right here. Because it's referencing something that was a shadow of that which was better to come. And that is, we have such a high priest. This is Jesus Christ, who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Now, notice with me in verse 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also meteor, mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Now, Jesus is only the high priest of that royal priesthood. If an individual is a part of this royal priesthood, then this individual is one who is a part, can say that Jesus is their high priest. We'll come back to the Hebrews 9 text in just a moment, but let's go ahead and turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2. Notice what Peter says here in 1 Peter chapter 2, and note with me if you would in verses 9 and 10. He makes a reference here to a royal priesthood. Who's he talking about? Well, he's talking to Christians here. And he says in verse 9, But you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now had obtained mercy. Previously, when the physical nation of Israel were God's people, they had a priesthood, and in that priesthood you had high priests. But the people themselves were not priests. Only those of the tribe of Levi could serve in that capacity. But now we, who at one time were not a people, he's talking about the church, he's talking about Christians, those who have now submitted unto the authority of Christ, you now are a part of this royal priesthood. And being a part of this royal priesthood brings with it the benefit of Jesus Christ serving as our high priest. Back to Hebrews chapter 9 again, and notice this time in verses 15, or 11 through 15. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 Keep this in mind, but Christ came as high priest, came as high priest to the good things to come, with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not as the creation. Notice that he is the perfect high priest. He can only be our high priest if we're willing to become a part of that royal priesthood. Think back again to the question that we've been asking, and it's, it's, I didn't put it on this chart here, but have you... Obeyed the gospel's call into salvation. Have you become a part of this royal priesthood? 
If not, then you cannot claim Christ as your high priest. But if you believe that Christ is the Son of God, if you believe that God sent Jesus to die upon the cross of Calvary for the remission of your sins, if you believe that you were lost in sins and that they need to be removed, forgiven by God, then you can obey the gospel's call into salvation and become a part of the royal priesthood, making Jesus Christ your high priest. And then the last question, as far as can you say about Jesus, is can you say that he is your brother? Think about that. Can you say that Jesus is your brother? Well, here's a simple answer or question to ask. Can you say that you are part of the family of God? If you're a part of the family of God, then you can say Jesus Christ is your brother. And someone says, how do we establish that fact? Well, we've already read within the scriptures earlier a passage that reminded us that Jesus is the Son of God. But John 3, 16, Jesus himself said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus came as the Son of God. He was born, in the, born of a woman, born in the flesh. He was the Son of God. He is the Son of God from that respect there. So if Jesus is the Son of God, then what does that make everyone else who becomes a Christian, who becomes a part of the family of God? Well, Paul makes a very interesting point to this end in Romans chapter 8 verses 14 through 17. Note with me there in Romans chapter 8 verses 14 through 17. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now notice the next phrase in verse 17, the next statement. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. We understand how Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus, the Word, has been, well, is is eternal, but was born into a fleshly body. And it's that sense that he became the Son of God. But he's the Son of God. And we find within the text that we can only be the children of God through the spirit of adoption if we are born again. It's what Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, that we, be, that we must be born of the water and of the Spirit in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Peter talks about this in 1 Peter chapter 1, that we are born again of an incorruptible seed that endures and lasts forever. There is this concept of this new birth. We are born again. Who's our heavenly Father? Well, it's God. And according to what Paul says, when we become a child of God through the spirit of adoption, we now become joint heirs with Christ. So yes, there is that sense wherein when an individual becomes a Christian, God becomes their heavenly father, and Christ becomes their brother, fellow heirs with Christ. So here's the thing, though. You can't just lay claim to it. I mean, somebody may look at my wonderful family and say, you know what, I want to be a part of your family. And I can say to them, you know, there's no other greater family in the world. We don't have any mistakes. We don't mess up. You know, nothing like that. Of course, I'm already lying, so there's one big old huge mistake. But say, okay, you can be a part of my family. And I may treat you like part of my family, but unless you're adopted into my family, you're not a part of my family, physically speaking, okay? I may treat you like family, but unless you're physically or adopted into my family, you're not really part of my family. But if I do adopt you into my family, then guess what? You are now part of that family forever and always. Before a person becomes a Christian, they're lost in sin. And God's not their heavenly father. By any stretch of the imagination, as much as they would like to call him their father, he's not. And for so many reasons, one of the most obvious ones is that they've not yet submitted unto his will. But if an individual will obey the gospel's call into salvation. Let let me remind you of what took place on the day of Pentecost that followed 
50 days after Jesus' death. Here you had a multitude of Jews had assembled there at the temple, assembled there in Jerusalem for the Pentecost. And while they were there, the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, and the apostles began to teach. And the apostles began to lay at the feet of the people their sin of having crucified Jesus Christ. In verse 36, Peter says, This man whom you've crucified, God has made both Lord and Savior. Now, when they were pricked to their heart, they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice what he said. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Well, those individuals, many of them that heard the word, gladly received it. And the Lord added them to the body. That day, 3,000 people were added by the Lord. And so what we find there within that example is on this day of Pentecost, those people who repented and were baptized, God added to the family to the kingdom, to the priesthood, added to the church, those individuals who were being saved that day. Now, if you're not a Christian, if you've not yet obeyed the gospel's call into salvation, if you've not yet seen the need, the conviction from the word to turn away from sin, we implore you this morning to give thought to that. Let us sit down and study with you show you the danger of sin, show you what Christ did so that you could be forgiven of your sin, and show you what you need to do to become one of God's children. And if you're willing to do that, we can baptize you into Christ. But it's only if you have the belief and the willingness to turn away from your sins. We do that. God adds you to the body. Your sins are washed away by the blood of the Lamb. You can now say that Jesus is your Savior. You can now say that Jesus is your high priest. You can now say that Jesus is your brother. You can now say that Jesus is your Lord and King. If You'll do that this morning. If you are a Christian, you've not been living faithfully. You're no longer living as one who is saved. You're no longer living as one who is submitted into the authority and reign of Christ. Then why not repent and be restored back to God's fellowship today? If you're subject to the gospel's call and invitation, come forward now as we stand and as we sing.